for 20 years, it was embargoed by the United States and by Western countries. In that period, the embargo applied to medicines, fertilizers, tractors, and so on. And yet, in 1949 to 1981, life expectancy increased from 35 to 68. The population virtually doubled from 554 million to 1,114 million. And in 1981, the World Bank published a report. According to that report, the life expectancy in China of 64 was higher than the average of 51 for low-income countries and 61 for middle-income countries, although China was still a poor country, a very poor country. Adult literacy stood at 66% compared with 30 and 72% in middle-income countries. While net primary school enrollment at 93% was just short of that for industrialized countries at 94%. At that time, basically, Chinese people were poor. And I think if Utsa went back to some of the rural areas, if she visited them in 1983, she will see very, very significant increases in the absolute standards that prevail. But at that time, according to Chinese poverty line, 30.7% were under the poverty line. Socialist China basically established new social relations of production because the view that was taken was that poverty was a consequence of capitalism. So in 1950, China adopted the agrarian reform law of the People's Republic of China. And by 1952, about 700 assigned to more than 300 farmers, 300 million farmers, 100 million farming households living in 4 million natural villages. Subsequently, China guaranteed work and the in education. From 1956, it established a minimum life guarantee, the so called Wu Park. So, in that period, China, although China was still a very poor country, made extraordinary progress, as other people have remarked, in addressing poverty. And indeed, you know, at that point in time, the World Bank took the view that there was no extreme poverty in China, although it was universally. In the 1970s, uh, the relationships with the United States improved and immediately, you know, under, under, uh, under Mao Zedong and under Zhou Enlai, China embarked on, in fact, opening up, acquiring capital goods from uh, Western countries. And then in 1979, China embarked on decentralization and market reform, leading, of course, to China's extraordinary economic growth. And that economic growth did make a contribution to poverty alleviation. Although the contribution to poverty alleviation was clearly less than it might have been had inequality not increased as much as it did. But in that period, there was an, an extraordinary transformation of the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And that, you know, I think that in a sense, oh, now underplayed that, the significance of that transformation. China realized, however, that meeting the most fundamental needs of all human, being, all human beings, the right to life, which itself depends on access more than economic growth, significantly more than economic growth. So in 1982, the State Council set up a leading group for agricultural development in the so-called Sansi, the Three Wests, in Lingxia. And what they started to put in place is what the development oriented program that's to a large extent shaped China's extraordinary success in, I would say, eliminating extreme poverty. At that time, most rural poverty was concentrated in 14, I think one can call contiguous destitute areas. These areas were recognized officially in 2010, but it was known much earlier. Poverty was largely concentrated in these often mountainous, remote areas, very difficult environmental conditions, often large shares of minority peoples. From that point in time, successive plans were implemented, adjusted, which explains, you know, why one moved to near uh, elimination of poverty and then suddenly it jumps because the standard was raised. 
successive plans were implemented. So from 1986 to 93, from 1994 to 2001, the 87 program, which identified 592 poor counties. And then in uh, 2001 uh, to 10, target, target villages were identified and households that needed assistance were identified. And then from 2010 to 20, a new poverty alleviation program was put in place. And then Jinjun Fupin, the targeted poverty alleviation program was put in place in 2013. So it's important to recognize that in 1999, China adopted common prosperity as a key goal. And that adoption of that objective played a very significant role in transforming China. In 2002, it phased out agricultural taxes and fees. It introduced agroecological compensation schemes to which generated incomes for rural people whose lands were converted to forest and to other uh, natural habitats. In 2003, it introduced a new rural cooperative medical insurance scheme, which costs extremely little and which covers a huge share of the costs of any illness that anyone has. And it has something like 97% coverage of the population. In 2007, DBAL, minimum subsistence allowance, was introduced and steps were taken to implement the target of nine years of compulsory education with absolutely dramatic progress in the last uh, seven or eight years. At the same time, by 1999, China adopted Western development. After 2005, it adopted the new socialist countryside. These programs put infrastructure into the countryside, into every single administrative village, the water, electricity, gas, uh, internet access, and so on. Wider regional planning for destitute areas involved major infrastructure investments. So the figure is a map of the Wuling Mountain area, which is one, one of these one of these destitute areas. And you can see the major infrastructure plans basically connecting that area with the cities of Chongqing, with Guiyang, with Guizhou province, with the Changsha in Hunan, with uh, Wuhan in Hubei province. So, this infrastructure played a very fundamental role because it, in a sense, created the conditions in which one could promote a development-oriented poverty alleviation program. And then, as has been explained, alongside that, China established these uh, individual plans with individual households, essentially designed to monitor their situation in extraordinary detail, to monitor the way it evolved over the course of time, to develop strategies through which they individually could address their housing conditions, their employment, and their uh, livelihood circumstances. So, I mean, I would argue that this was uh, an extraordinarily successful program, which basically did achieve, you know, did remove, you know, the scourge of extreme poverty in China. And as Eureka actually explained at the beginning, it's a program that, a process that will continue. So, why was it successful? Well, for forty four major reasons. The first was sustained and determined political and financial commitment. In the last eight years, 1.6 trillion yuan. And that was not all that was spent because uh, there were significant social contributions as well. In a political and economic system whose central goal is shared prosperity, which is accepted that addressing poverty is the common responsibility of all and that poverty is not the fault of the poor. Second, a set of institutional mechanisms that integrate central design, central planning of a clear overall strategy, subnational responsibility and decentralized city, county, local, village implementation. Third, an extraordinary and sustained mobilization of human resources, which has already been mentioned. I mean, the chart just plots the numbers of village-based work teams that were in service in the last seven years, where these people worked with individual households and individual persons in order their lives. And four specific socialist aspects of China's development model, including the role of public investment and a modification of welfare services and a set of collective rural assets and rural property rights that afford a degree of security, solidarity and opportunity. Thank you.